The Canadian Wild Turkey Federation presents Turkey Talk <laughs> with your hosts, the guys that keep it real. From the real outdoor experience, it's Carlin Riley and Ian McCleary. Stay tuned, folks. We discuss way more than just turkey hunting tips and tricks. If conservation, protection, and enhancement of the outdoors is important to you, you have come to the right place. It's go time. Three, two, one, let's go. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the CWTF's Turkey Talk podcast, hosted by the guys from the Real Outdoor Experience, Carlin and Ian. Today, we have a couple of experts from our favorite optics company, Vortex Optics. We have the Red Dot Guru, Daryl Wilson, and the Technical Field Advisor, Champion Marksman, and all-around Library of Shooting Knowledge, Reg Wales. Welcome, guys, and thanks so much for being on Turkey Talk. Great to see you guys. Thank you. Nice to see you. Hey guys, thanks. Now, thanks for the introduction. I won't be able to get a hat on my head. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, you deserve it. So, <laughs> so today we're talking about turkey hunting, and more specifically, because you guys are on the show, we're talking about red dots, vortex optics, on our firearms and the use of binos and spotting scopes for turkey hunting. So let's start with the red dots. Now, Ian and I have, I'm not going to divulge the number of red dots we have, uh, but we have a number of them. Uh, one of my all time favorites, uh, probably because I've been most successful with it, is the Strike Fire. So I'll put a picture up on the screen for anybody that's watching. And uh, for you, for those of you that are listening, you'll have to go and check out Vortex Canada's website and, and look at the Strike Fire. So I have the, the Strike Fire is the red green 4 MOA on top of a 12 gauge Mossberg turkey gun. And I've kind of modified that gun a little bit. And it's a sentimental piece for me. It's the, the gun that I took my first turkey with. And uh, I still use it today. It's, it's a decent setup. And I really, really like the simplicity of the red dot. I also like the fact that I can keep both eyes open. It gives me a little bit better field of view when I'm, when I'm watching this turkey do his little dance across the field and towards the, the uh, decoys. And it's so simple. Turn it on. There's the red dot. It's, it's just perfect. Red dots have come such a long way. The uh, The first red dot that I had was geez, probably 25, maybe pushing 30 years ago, and I actually put it on a crossbow. And one of the first times I'd gone, I'd like, been practicing and shooting in my backyard and stuff like that. I went out to go hunting and realized that the uh, I'd forgotten to shut it off when I was finished with my, my shooting, and the battery was dead on it. <laughs> It totally wrecked my hunt. And you know what? That's never happened with the, uh, with the Vortex product yet because they, uh, the, well, the batteries seem to just run absolutely forever, but they certainly have come a long way. So, Daryl, when it, when it comes to the, to the red dots, if somebody that is interested in, in going out turkey hunting and they're just thinking about their setup, what would be the difference or the advantage to looking at a, like a Venom or a Razor versus a Strike Fire or a Spark? Well, uh, I mean, what are the advantages if you're comparing one of our micro red dots? So the Venom and the Razor that you're referring to are referred to uh, the micro red dots. So they have an open, uh, they're essentially an open site. Uh, so this open site allows you, uh, all of the red dots are, are going to be um, parallax free uh, with unlimited eye relief. So the positioning behind uh, the optic as well as the firearm uh, is going to become that much easier with either choice, whether or not you're going with one of the micro red dots or if you're going with the strike fire, as you have mentioned. Another uh, feature with regards to the uh, Venom or the Razor in comparison with the strike fire uh, is you can mount it that much lower. When, when you're talking about turkey hunting, you're, you're obviously talking about mounting it onto a shotgun. And with regards to the design of a shotgun, mounting the optic is as close to the barrel as possible is usually the objective or always the objective. So the Venom and the Razor are going to allow you to mount it that much closer to the barrel of the firearm and get it closer on uh, lower on the rail so that you can uh, have the proper uh, cheek rest position on your shotgun. No, that's a that's a lot of information. When it comes to the the, the parallax that you're talking about, that's the, the the eye relief as you get close to a traditional rifle scope, right? Yes, essentially. So, I mean, the, the parallax does refer to um, it's 
Parallax free will mean when the site's on target, you can move your head around and the reticle itself is not going to move. That's a great ex explanation of exactly what that means. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a very simplistic, uh, again, um, in choosing red dots and choosing the reticles, keeping it simple is usually a good idea in, in, in <laughs> almost any application here. So overcomplicating, um, yeah. I mean, you can overcomplicate parallax. Uh, I've heard uh, plenty of definitions, and what I've just given you is is really uh, what I've been able to break it down and and provide to customers when I do have someone call in and say, "Hey, what is this parallax that I keep hearing people refer to?" So, is parallax free is that all of them? Yes. Uh, you know what? That's actually every time I have one of these conversations, you wind up picking up something that you know I hadn't, I hadn't realized before. But why that's important, I think, to a turkey hunter is that when you're you're sitting in a you know leaning back up against a tree, you got your knees up, you get your rifle rested or your shotgun rested on your knee, being able to keep your the the red dot while you're moving your head around or coming at it from different angles. Um, knowing that it's still going to be shooting exactly where you're, you're centered for is he, uh, that's a great piece of information. Yeah. So Daryl, um, you've, you've said a lot of names of different optics. So there's the Viper, there's the Venom. Uh, I talked about the strike fire, the razor. I had the privilege of putting a razor on my 20 gauge slug gun, uh, last fall. And I loved, I think it was, was it your recommendation that I, that, that I go with that particular unit? Uh, maybe it was Ken's or it was Vortex recommendation instead of the, the Venom. And I loved how robust it was because with deer hunting with shotguns, everybody, anybody that does that, you're walking through the woods, you're knocking it off trees, there's snow falling on it. I had zero problems the whole week. So, um, and I was very successful with that combination. But I guess just to kind of highlight for people that are listening, um, the differences for between Venom, Viper, and Razor. So they're all very similar. They're, they're the holographic style uh, optics. Why the difference? So uh, between if we're comparing the Venom to the Viper to the Razor, um, there there are differences. And why are why are there differences? Well, uh, I mean, for example, the Viper has the lowest profile of the three. Uh, the Viper is designed; it does have a bottom battery feed. The reason for the bottom battery feed is to maintain the low profile. Why do we want to have the low profile on the Viper? Uh, this is for the the, the co-witnessing, whether it's absolute or the one third co-witness. Um, this allow the low profile allows you to achieve that. So that is where I would highly recommend the Viper and its low profile for a lot of our pistol applications. Uh, so obviously not in relation to turkey hunting, but that's where the Viper it really shines is in the pistol application due to its low profile. Uh, the, the Viper is a 6 MOA dot. Uh, it is not available in a 3 MOA, and that, that is where it differs ever so slightly with the Venom. The Venom has a very similar profile to the Viper, but it has a top battery feed. So while it makes it easier for you to change out your batteries when the battery does perish, um, it, um, it doesn't allow for that low profile of the Viper. Um, so the Venom there is also offered in three and six MOA. So you do have a difference there between the Venom and the Viper. Where the Razor comes in is the Razor is essentially, as you mentioned, it's very robust in its design as well as in its construction features. The um, coating on the lenses, uh, the construction features of the unit, and the side battery feed for myself, I really enjoy the side compartment battery feed. It just makes uh, changing the battery that much more simple. Um, and again, the Razor itself is also available in a 3 MOA as well as a 6 MOA. So across the board, I would say very simply, the Viper, I would uh, most likely recommend in a lot of the pistol applications. The Venom 3 would be what I would recommend for this particular um, uh, application for if I was putting an optic onto my shotgun for turkey hunting, I would be looking at either the Razor 3 MOA or the Venom 3 MOA. The reason for that is I do enjoy the construction. I do enjoy the ease of changing out a battery should you need to do that in the field, uh, as well as the size of the dot. The, the 3 MOA will allow you with a finer point of aim when you are targeting one of your 
targets one of your turkeys. And that's what I was just going to ask. Sorry, Ian. Oh, uh, we're just going to you know, just same, gonna, probably the same question. Um, <laughs> when you say three MOA and six MOA, we're talking about the size of the dot. Yes, sir. Okay. So yes, sir. The, the, the wants to know what uh, what a three, the difference between a three and a six MOA is, is simply the size of the dot that you're going to see in the optic as you look through. Yes. Where that, yes. Does, that, that becomes more of a factor, I think, in your sort of maybe perhaps rifle shooting and shooting at longer distances where a bigger dot is going to take up more of the target. And you, you want to be able to have a finer point of uh, a finer point of aim. Mentioning the uh, the battery replacement on the the Viper, it's a base mount, right? You, so you've got to actually remove the sight to replace the battery. That is yeah. correct. Yeah. So every so just to jump in, so every time I think I know where you're going with this, Ian, and that's every time you remove that battery, then you've got to re-zero the unit again. So. Put it on a on a shotgun, and you're going to pattern it. So if you do have to change the the sight out, even though you are patterning the shotgun, um, the difference in the point of impact on the target will be pretty marginal. Yeah. Well, and you know what the uh, the batteries, like I said right at the, at the beginning, have I get the, the, the over three thousand hours of battery life in those batteries. I think, and that's yeah. Uh, I think part of everybody's uh, sort of spring ritual should be to uh, change your batteries, get, you know, recite it in, practice with your loads, and uh, then you're all ready for the season. I think you could probably leave it on for most of the season. <laughs> <laughs> I, guess, I guess we can add that to change your batteries uh, when you turn the clocks back. Smoke alarms and then yeah. sex optics. <laughs> Yeah, but you're right. Like uh, the the battery life is just really ridiculous. And some of the units that Daryl's going to be talking about today, I believe, coming up with uh, alternative methods of making that that battery last even longer. So for the average hunter out there, when they're going to squawk about, oh, I got to put a battery in it. Um, let's face it: if we put a battery in it once per season, it's not a big deal. But the chances are, um, one battery is going to last you several years for the average shooter. Um, I would be more likely to take it out if the if the rifle or sorry the rifle or shotgun was to be put away in the cabinet for a long period of time. They pull the battery out so we don't have the, any chance of corroding. Uh, but for the most part, yeah, these things you start looking at the overall battery when they start stating you know thirty thousand hours or one hundred fifty thousand hours. That's pretty ridiculous. It's uh, I don't think anyone has anything to cry about for a battery. <laughs> well, and it also shut off automatically. Like if you do forget to uh, to shut it off and you put it back in your case on a you know, on one weekend, pull it out on the next weekend, it will be in a, you know, in a sleeping state and you got to turn it back on again. Yeah. Well, Daryl, do you want to just mention about that, about the auto shutoffs and some of the units with the, yeah. with the objective cap? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. I'd be have to, happy to. The majority of our units do come out, come with an auto shutoff function feature uh, and it typically engages anywhere from 12 to 14 hours. It all depends on the unit that you're referring to, um, but the, typically the majority of them will have the auto uh, shutoff function. And just to Reg's point, it is always recommended that if you are storing your, your firearm and or your optic for a, a significant period of time, removing the battery uh, from it. I mean, this obviously, anytime the battery's in the unit for long periods of time and in connection with the contact points, some battery drain will occur. And again, batteries aren't cheap. So uh, it is always recommended if you are storing it for a long period of time to remove the battery to maintain the battery power. But also additionally, as we've all seen, I'm sure once or twice, maybe in one of our old Walkmans or something like that, pulling the batteries out after they've leaked on the inside of a unit. I mean, that's okay on a you know, fifty, sixty dollar Walkman. You certainly don't want that happening on one of your one of your optics, especially when it's one of the most important tools you'll be using in your hunt. So, oh, what color was your Walkman? I was going to say you're dating your CD player. <laughs> that was intentional, gentlemen. That was intentional. I wanted to give a shout out to the old Sony Walkmans. <laughs> that's for the really, that's for the over forty crowd right there, buddy. I could just but, see yeah. the big hair. And then, you know what? When you talk about the auto shutoff, you know, if you were to, I know one of the com complaints, I guess, old school, was, or you know, a long time ago, with some of the older red dots, you have to, you know, turn it on um, before you could before you could see. And you didn't want to turn it on and you know hunt for you know eight or nine hours 
in an on position because that that was your battery life back then so having to turn it on and then get target acquisition you don't have to do that anymore you can turn it on in the morning when you get out of your vehicle and you know shut it off at the end of the day it could be on the entire time there's no drain whatsoever well, and even as you had mentioned, some of the advancements in red dot technology and the way, way, way where they've come from in the last, call it 20 years, I mean, it's continuing on and we can get into it a little bit uh, in a little bit more detail. But just on the battery life, uh, for, new for 2021, uh, Vortex has released the Spark Solar Unit, uh, which actually has and comes equipped with some D-Tech uh, lighting technology. So what that does is it's a, it's not a solely just a solar unit. It's a battery operated unit that pulls from solar energy energy when it can and what it how it utilizes this is it uh, utilizes the DTEC technology as and as long as there is enough ambient lighting to power uh, the unit via solar it will only use the solar power the moment there isn't enough solar energy powering the unit it switches over into the battery and utilizes that and on some of the numbers that we've been talking about on on the battery life it's you know starting at highest setting on one of our lower units at 150 hours to one of the uh, the lower settings will bring it out to 30,000. The spark solar that we're referring to uh, in conjunction with a battery as well as the solar can get upwards of 150,000 hours from the unit. How many hunting days is that? That's a lot. Of uh, <laughs> that's, that's a lot of hunting days. That's a lot of turkeys, I'm sure. <laughs> You'd have to give up the fire hall and do this full time. <laughs> to get, get that battery. <laughs> You know, that's a, actually is a, is a great segue into one of the things that I've been excited about talking about today is what, what's new with Vortex? What, uh, it, it, or the, like the solar power um, sort of option, what else is coming down the pipe? Well, that, that's a great question, and there there is a quite a bit uh, to talk about. But with regards to uh, like turkey hunting in specific, uh, that's why I selected the Spark Solar for today because that one is something that we can use in conjunction with uh, uh, with turkey hunting. Um, but uh, absolutely, I mean, we have launched uh, a whole uh, new lineup of tripods this year um, that are phenomenal, uh, and we could certainly uh, go into those in greater detail. Um, what else? I mean, we have completely relaunched the Spitfire, uh, which is one of our prism optics. So the three times and the five times is a new addition to that. The three times uh, used to have uh, two pick rails up on the front of it. Uh, and in an effort of trying to make it more snag free, uh, they've uh, narrowed it down into a construction that's similar uh, to uh, or comparable to the Crossfire and or the Spark 2, if you're familiar with the Spark 2 or even the Spark AR. Folks, we're going to be covering an awful lot of ground here. You can find all of these things on vortexoptics.com. <laughs> yes, as well. Yes, and vortexcanada.net as well for our friends uh, north of the border here. Uh, vortexcanada.net will have uh, all of this information. And then for uh, product how-to videos as well as uh, some even promotional videos, our friends down at Vortex USA really do a bang-up job um, and have uh, a full team of uh, social media as well as uh, um, digital content creation specialists down there. So vortexoptics.com. Um, and if you would like anything, with a Canadian twist to it, um, visit vortexcanada.net. Why don't you mention the uh, tripods? I never would have thought that tripods would be a, a common thing in the, the, the back of my vehicle during hunting season. But I mean, the like even the, the range finders, if you're looking out at, you know, 800 to 1,000 yards, you've got an awful lot of wobble if you're just trying to hold that on your own. Being able to just pop that or your binoculars on um on a tripod like the the little attachment that allows you to put your binoculars onto the, the tripod and be able to sit and watch hands-free it's been a game changer for me i never would have thought that a, a a tripod strapped to the side of my pack was going to be part of my hunting repertoire it absolutely is today no. to but, add yeah. to add to that to add to that little comment right there it's really interesting you say that because tripods today the ones that especially in our lineup they're so versatile that we, we're coming up with carbon fiber now that's in our lineup. But think about this spring, this in, uh, not too long from now, you're going to be sitting against a tree. And wouldn't it be nice to be hands-free? So with our tripods that can go down to a really low position in the seated position, you could take a tripod with you and you can actually mount your shotgun up on the tripod. You could be almost hands-free using your calls and very little movement, right? You don't have to have that shotgun 
if you, especially if you have a mobility problem, anyone out there that can't sit for long periods of time and hold the shotgun and whatnot, because uh, we do have quite a few customers who are disabled and ask us these kinds of questions. And I've had them use tripods in the past and use like a, like a pig saddle kind of hookup onto it. And they're able to put that shotgun into the brace and sit right there nice and steady. And then they can use calls, they can use binos, whatever they want. Um, and then it's hands-free. So that's such a, such a cool tool to have. So it's not just for your, for your wife for taking pictures with, but you can actually use this and integrate it into your hunting technique. Don't put me down for two. I need one for the big camera and then one for the gun. I can get three and then one for the <laughs> one for the range finder, one for the binoculars, one for the gun, and one for the camera. So they can be up there with four different products. Yeah, exactly. Nice. Now you're on you're thinking of now. You're thinking. You're on my wavelength now. <laughs> like, you know what's funny? You know the uh, the um, the ATV mounting gun holders that just look like a Y with a sort of a screw thing. I yeah. Like, are you mean the Colpin ones where they're, they're grip ones on them? Yeah, exactly. I yeah. years and years and years ago, I was trying to adapt one of those to a, uh, to a tripod just to be able to use in that exact same scenario. Could never get it to work. You know, I know that there, there are yeah. products out there that you can buy, but very excited to learn that you guys actually have a, uh, something available now. That's great. I, I know we're kind. Of, I know we're kind of getting off topic and getting the weeds away from Turkey, but this still applies. Like again, give you that one example for using uh, a tripod for something other than you would anticipate using it for. So if you get like a pig saddle or something like that, similar to what you were trying to attempt, yep. but the, they go right onto our right onto our tripods. And then, excuse me, and the new tripods that we have too are Arca Swiss compatible. So there's plenty of options for a customer to grab um, an Arca Swiss rail off a firearm or they can manipulate it using uh, again a pig saddle and use it and they can incorporate it in their shooting position once again. So there's lots of ways to to use those uh, especially for turkey hunting too right. So as, as we're sitting by the tree anyone that's done some time looking for birds uh, the last thing you need to do is have a lot of movement. So the dirty birds are going to pick that up pretty quick. <laughs> so, uh, making use of other things such as tripods, whatever you can to keep your profile low, keep you from moving. Um, it's all going to be a better for you for success. But as you get older, and I think I speak for us over 40 crowd and getting close to 50 is that we also <laughs> like comfort. <laughs> so uh, having comfort and stability and that tripod once set up can also aid you to be able to zero and pattern your shotgun with that red dot that you have on. It's so funny talking about comfort and how often that is actually coming up in, uh, in conversation and turkey hunting is, a, is such a prime example of that because you cannot get away with movement. You know, you can with, you know, with deer to a certain extent or other big game and certainly with ducks and geese, you know, you can move around, not at critical times, but you know, with turkeys, it seems like that every time you move, you're busting, you know, you're, you're, you're getting seen and being able to, to be comfortable in your seat or with your, you know, with your optics or with your gun. It's just so, so important that yeah, quality uh, rests and, seats and clothing become very important for those of us over 50. So last yeah. year, I don't want to take up too much of Daryl's time because I wanted to get onto the red dots, but just to let you know, last year I took a bird from a ground blind and inside the ground blind, I was just in a seated position in a, in a nice comfy little you know lawn chair, living at large. And that's exactly what I did. I put the tripod up and I, I had my blind. So I just opened the window on the blinds just slightly <laughs> for the birds. And uh, I was just sitting in there eating, you know, that's the beautiful thing, right? About turkey. You can eat the stinkiest stuff you want. You can have all the beef jerky and you're good to go. And I just, I sat in there guys with, and I had the, I had my shotgun up on the tripod and I took a bird with the tripod and uh, with it mounted on there and in a pig saddle. And, and I got to tell you, it's, it really is phenomenal. It's, it's so easy. It's like, it's, uh, it's great. And especially for a young shooter, if you were to take a young shooter out with you, um, something that's very near and dear to all of our hearts is conservation and most importantly, shot placement to make sure um, we harvest that bird in the most ethical way. So having those types of accessories available with the red dot in tow um, makes it much more user-friendly for for that new shooter, whether it's a young person or an older person just getting into it, but um, it helps all that stuff helps aid in accuracy. So it's a, it's a win-win situation for everyone. So those types of things um, are, can be blended into use for Turkey really, really, really well. Uh, that's a great segue, Reg. Um, 
Daryl, um, people have, like I said, we, we use red dots on our turkey guns. People use uh, open sights. And, and, you know, I've had, well, a number of us have um, regular optics, uh, scopes on our shotguns with crosshairs reticles. What are, what would you say the advantage is to using a red dot over uh, a standard optic on a shotgun for the purposes of turkey hunting? Like the, turkey hunting is close range, obviously. So there's one disadvantage of a red dot, but what do you think the advantages are uh, of a red dot there in that situation? Yeah, so if we're comparing a red dot to a, like a, a low power variable optic, uh, you know, two to seven or something along those lines, I mean, very simply, target acquisition comes up uh, immediately, as well as field of view. Um, having a quick target acquisition, having a simple red dot, uh, uh, two MOA, three MOA, uh, a very simple red dot uh, allows you to pinpoint and, and acquire your target that much quicker. Um, additionally, um, as you mentioned, the shorter distances, there's really no need of magnification, in my opinion, in, in a turkey hunting scenarios. I mean, you're looking at, what, 20, 30, 40 yards, somewhere around there, typically, anyways. I mean, uh, that I know that can vary, but in addition to those varying distances, that's another reason why a red dot would, uh, would be uh, – ideal compared to a lower power, low power variable optic is, uh, again, you don't know, maybe you're going to have your target or your, um, decoys set up. Um, and you don't necessarily know which direction that Turkey is going to come from. Uh, so it's, let's say it's coming for your setup and you're looking in this direction and the Turkey comes from over in this direction for whatever reason, having a red dot that you can quickly with the unlimited eye relief that you can quickly change your shooting position from here, over to here, allowing you for that quick target acquisition, as well as the additional field of view. If you were having a, a two to seven and say you were on the six times magnification and you were utilizing that as your field of view, your field of view is going to be very small and you're going to have an opportunity to miss a heck of a lot about what's going on around you. And additionally, utilizing the, the red dot shooting with both eyes open, having that additional field of view and the unlimited eye relief, you can quite literally choose where you position the red dot on your rail uh, when you're utilizing that based on on your use. Bringing the red dot closer back to you or to the back end of the rail is going to give you the um, the appearance of a larger field of view while looking through the optic where mounting it further far forward on the rail is going to allow you for more of a general field of view. Right. That's a great explanation. It, 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 it's such a, a <laughs> such a complicated, a seemingly simple thing. You know, putting a, a, a sight on a shotgun. I mean, you know, a shotgun blasts, a, you know, a bunch of pellets. How specific do we have to be? And it's like, oh my gosh, you know, when, when you put a turkey choke in a shotgun inside 10 yards, you know, your, your, your pattern's the size of a, you know, a baseball and getting out to 40 yards, you know, you're still, you know, basketball size may be bigger. When you have a no sight, you're just putting a, you know, a, a using a bead on the end of your shotgun, depending on how much of your barrel you can see when you pull up is going to have an impact and being able to line it up with the base of your receiver. Like that's a lot, particularly for a new shooter to try to pay attention to. And I think that that's why people miss a lot of turkeys when they're not using optics. When you go to um, an optic, whether it's, you know, reticles or a red dot, it's forcing you to aim and you don't have to really think about the mechanics of the, of the shotgun itself or, you know, what you're, um, where you're positioned on the gun. The thing that I like about the red dot is that as soon as your red dot is on the target, almost no matter where your head is on your shotgun, it's going to shoot exactly where you're aiming. That's a, that's a really critical point too, because um, shotguns are not meant theoretically to aim, right? We just point. So that's exactly where you're getting at. And if you're not doing a little bit of training to get that proper uh, sight on the bead, so actually getting low as you can to see that rail going down on the bead, and you're basically just doing a hasty, a hasty aim at, at the bird. So when you just run with a straight bead, uh, it, you're absolutely 100% correct because it's, it really does take some time, right? It takes some training to understand where you're going to impact on the target with, even though you are shooting, uh, you are shooting a shot, you're shooting a lot of pellets. So when Daryl gets into this, he'll be talking about, you know, the bonuses of using the red dot for grouping uh, because then you have 
a defined aiming point that you can use to group and you can kind of tune your group um, because when you're trying to, that's the whole idea is you want to pattern your shotgun for a certain distance to get X number of pellets into the head and neck. But to do that, am I really getting a proper zero? And how do you zero with a bead on the end of the right, on the shotgun? It's a, let's face it, guys, it's a Hail Mary, isn't it? It's just, you're trying whatever seems to pattern the best. That's what we would do in the old, back in the day when we were kids, that's, but we don't have to do that today. We can do the red dot. Now we have an adjustable uh, adjustable firearm site that we can actually manipulate to make it work with whatever shot pattern you have available to you. And that's going to be specific to a, yes, your choke and specific to your ammunition. So now we, we actually have some options. And, and again, you're right too, that it doesn't matter where your head is. If you, as long as you've got that red dot on the target, um, you're going to pray for rain and you're going to knock the bird, knock the bird down. So it's, we go back. I always think about, I teach hunter ed for young kids and I always think about simplicity, right? And Daryl's, I think Daryl's already mentioned it, keeping the simple. And with the red dot being in tow on a shotgun, it makes it so much easier for younger shooters to understand the concept that, hey, I don't need to line up one, two, or three different points of interest to aim on my target. You just, this is what you have. You have a circle, a red, D, uh, a red dot, just placed on the head and neck. And that's what you would need to be focused on. So, and we see that across the board, not just turkey hunting, but from all aspects of shooting is that that simplicity that Daryl's talking about here is that's the, that's basically the selling point for the red dot is simplicity. Um, and easy. it's just too damn easy. It's just so easy. And we're seeing <laughs> even when guys and girls are putting them on rifles and AR rifles back before, I don't even want to say it. It gives me a <laughs> but, uh, back back before uh, last year is that that was a trend, right, guys? You're like seeing the the iron sights are going to the the way of the dodo bird, and things are coming in on the electronic stage just simply because we want to improve the possibility of getting hits on target. To do that, let's focus on the simplicity of the red dot. So we're not trying to line up rear, front, and then the target image. So that lends very nicely into turkey hunting because we're at extremely short ranges, but we also too have a very small target that we need to engage. And that's just the head and the neck. So getting those pellets in there is it's a chore because you do have to take time out to pattern, but you got to make sure you have that adjustability. And that's where the red dot really shines. And you know what, when you can spend that time preseason with a, uh, you know, with a youngster or somebody that's newer to the sport and, get the mechanics of your shooting down as soon as you go into the woods and you're hearing gobbles and the spit and the drumming and it's coming closer and closer and closer suddenly the turkey's in front of you that you can hear the breath yeah. increase and the heart rate pounding and all that training goes right out the window <laughs> yeah it, it really well it's like if you ever hunted with dogs or deer hunting for the very first time i'm not a big person to do that but i have relatives that do and i've i've tagged along a few times and uh it's that first time, right? That first time experience of hearing the dogs howling and, and yipping. And then, you know, the deer are coming towards you. Your pa your heart is literally chasing out of your chest. <laughs> for someone new, even for the first, you think about your first bird that you took, it's the same thing, right? It's like, oh my God, I can't believe the bird's actually here. <laughs> so all that stuff that you were talking about earlier, Ian, that it kind of does go out the window. That's why it's great to have that, that senior person there with someone young to teach them and coach them and try to get them to calm down and say, yeah, focus on the red dot, put the red dot right there. That's where you need to go. Focus, 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 and let her have it. So yeah, again, we, it's just, there's all that emotions. There's so many things that are involved with hunting uh, and that comes with experience too. And we've been there as you start to knock the birds over, it's, it just becomes, yeah, I'm going to go out and grab a bird. Um, but you still need to go through all what you need to go through. But it's that preseason checklist that we all need to go through. And this is something that I think as we move along, I think hunters are becoming more aware. They're becoming more tech savvy. Um, and they're starting to realize the importance of putting the time in, putting the time in and patterning shotguns. Um, and, and what can I use to better my chances and make things easier? And as we get older, our eyes are getting bad. Um, you're going to have to compensate. So maybe red dots aren't the best choice for you. Um, so when I, I want to turn this over to Daryl, but those are the types of things when I think of, uh, whether as a hunter ed instructor or as a hunter myself, 
Um, those are things that I think about myself as the preseason, getting myself ready, getting my firearm ready. Um, and my eyes are crap right now. So <laughs> do I need to, do I need to throw the red dot aside and pick up like a, a one to four or something like that and uh, go with a, a variable optic? And that's also an option as well. Sorry, Daryl, to rain, to take up your majority of time. You know, that actually brings up a really great point. And what about a variable optic with a red dot uh, reticle? Like we, we can do that too. Yeah. Well, Daryl, why don't you tell them, Daryl, we do, I, I, I guess we are getting in the weeds, but that is a very good option right there as well, because yeah. people, people think that you can't run a variable on a shotgun for Turkey, but it does. It's, it's just a sighting device. You can run it on a potato gun, man, if you want, it's, it's going to work. So the beautiful <laughs> thing is, you're all, yeah. You're, uh, I wish I had a. I wish I had a cannon. Actually. <laughs> yeah, you, the government would just confiscate it anyways, right? Yeah, right. Uh, but for the most part, the um, yeah, you can easily run a variable optic for turkey as well. If the the thing is, what Daryl was saying too, like you are shooting close ranges. You're at twenty. You know, you're at twenty yards, thirty yards, or closer. Um, do you really need to have any type of magnification? Uh, I agree with them. I don't think you do. I think uh, a red dot would be sufficient. We sell the hell out of these things for when it comes turkey hunting, uh, just because of the price point as well. It's mm -hmm. it's, it's cheap. But no, to your point, absolutely. Having a, a low powered variable optic with an illuminated reticle uh, would, would certainly provide its benefits. I mean, having the illuminated reticle, um, it's going to have brightness adjustments that you can change uh, and same with all of our red dots as well, varying brightness levels that you can adjust for the varying lighting conditions that you're going to experience in a day of turkey hunting. Uh, from low light conditions in the morning to uh, throughout the day, uh, you can increase the brightness as you need to or decrease it as you need to. And to that point, uh, the Venom has an auto brightness mode on it uh, so that it actually adjusts itself automatically to the ambient lighting conditions for you so that that just eliminates one more consideration when you're out in the field. It's not blinding when you're uh, in a low light condition. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. It's, so it's, it's easy to forget sometimes that, uh, you know, we're, we're spoiled. I know Carlin's talking about his, he's got a Viper on his uh, turkey gun and a Venom on his, his deer setup. And, you know, we are really are blessed to be able to have all those different options. You know, and I thinking back to, to when I was first starting to, to hunt, um, I actually traded a, a BSA 270 and I kicked myself for doing it today, but I traded for a Remington 870 so that I could have one gun to do it all. And I had a, a deer barrel and a, <laughs> you know, a, a smooth board, but that, that was my gun for everything. I, grouse hunting, rabbit hunting, duck hunting, goose hunting, deer hunting, just needed the one gun. And if you're going to have just one gun, I would encourage everybody to, uh, um, to look at, you know, whether it's a Mossberg 500 or if you want to step it up into the, the Mossberg 930, probably, but I would go shotgun for sure. If somebody was going to have one optic to throw on that gun and use it again, all, you know, so it's, you know, deer and turkey, you know, optics for, um, for waterfowl is a bit of a different conversation, but deer and turkey hunting, what would you suggest for sort of your, your one gun? Oh. Well, I mean, that's a that's a tough one to narrow it down. I'm a guy that uh, has a difficult time narrowing down what I'm looking for and would probably go for more uh, than less. But we'd be remiss to not talk about the Crossfire Red Dot. Um, I mean, the Crossfire Red Dot in and of itself is a phenomenal, phenomenal optic. It has um, a low and a high mount, um, and it is, is probably one of the most budget-minded optics getting in there. So for people new to hunting, people that are taking uh, the expenditure out and getting into a new, uh, a new shotgun, whether it be the uh, Mossberg 500 or the 930, as you've mentioned, the Crossfire will certainly help you, uh, I don't know, uh, afford some of that ever-increasing expensive ammunition to put in that shotgun. Um, it's, uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful optic. The Crossfire itself, um, I mean, it comes in with a two MOA red dot, the multi-height mounting system, as I mentioned. So it comes with a low mount and a high mount. So depending on if you wanted to switch it out from, right, uh, from your shotgun to a rifle or anything and you wanted to lower or raise it, it does come with that option. Uh, and additionally, 50,000 hours um, uh, battery life on that uh, with night vision device capabilities. Uh, the Crossfire would, would absolutely, hands down, probably be my choice um, for all of those reasons. 
such a workhorse optic. It's funny, Reg, you made a point a, a couple of minutes ago about not overcomplicating it. It's a sighting device. Mm -hmm. So you can take virtually any of these and mount it to any gun, right? Like, obviously, there are going to be some, you know, that are pistol specific or, you know, tactical specific. But for the most part, you can take any of these and put these on your, your rifle or your shotgun. Yeah, you know, I think the majority of the people that, that kind of look at an optic, they, they kind of pigeonhole hole it and think it's only made for one specific. And we have a, a, whole, a lot of SKUs in our lineup that are, we advertise them as AR platform rifle scopes and that. But in theory, you can use it on anything. You're absolutely right. Like when I was joking about you can put it on a potato gun, like it just gives you the idea that all it's doing is just compensating for the trajectory of whatever you're putting down range. So with that being said, yeah, yeah, you can you can run whatever you want, man. And on the gun, it doesn't matter. You can, if you want to be completely out in cloud nine and be foolish, you can run a high power variable on a shotgun. But it doesn't make sense. It's just there's there's a place for each uh, optic that's going to be optimal. And and I think where where we're at now in the discussion side of things with turkey hunting, uh, Daryl is 100% correct. Like for dollar for dollar. Um, the value that you're getting, uh, it's really tough to beat that crossfire. And that's why that crossfire came to be. It's to be something that everyone can afford. Um, it's a no-nonsense no site because it doesn't have a lot of electronic gadgetry to it. It Obviously, it does run on a battery, but it's got a rheostatic dial. So it's not on-off. It's just on and you turn it to your setting. Uh, the, the only negative I could say with that is that you just ha you can't put it away and forget that it's on because you're going to come back. It is going to be dead. Uh, the battery's going to die. But that's the cost savings to that is to keep it simple. And I think for the most part, when we go out in the field, you, you once you once you clear the house and you look wherever you are and you're getting out in the field and you load up. Once you do that, you just turn the site on. And you forget about it, and then you're done at the end of the day. Um, I kind of think of things as batteries are like barrels on rifles, right? They're a consumable product. They wear out. So you could buy a, bar a battery in, from your local grocery store and you put it in your optic or put it in anything, a watch or whatever you have, and it may only last you a few hours because the battery was crap to begin with. So um, when we run batteries, one thing that we like to do is try to promote use lithium batteries because they do last a longer. But if you do forget to uh, turn it off and you have an alkaline battery, and the crossfire and you leave it for a season in your gun locker for the rest of the season, you come back next turkey season to pick it up. There is a good possibility that battery has corroded the internal components and may damage it. And if that's the case, then the first person you're going to call is you're going to be speaking with Daryl and we'll, we'll fix that up. <laughs> if the chances are that we're not able to repair it, if we can't, then Daryl will, I, I shouldn't speak at a turn for Daryl because that's Daryl's forte, but, um, and he does it very well that, uh, that he's going to look after you and replace it. So no, no hurt, no foul. But at the same time, it's kind of like good, good housekeeping rules, right? Is to turn it on when you're going, make sure you, you when you unload, turn it off, make sure if it's long, prolonged storage, take the battery out or at least use a, a lithium battery. That, that's so funny that you, uh, you say that barrels are a consumable item. So that just reminds me <laughs> of your military days. I've never replaced a barrel. I, I just don't shoot enough, you know, thousands and thousands of rounds through a barrel to replace them. But that's yeah. funny. neither does the army when it's on the queen's dollar, right? You just, keep, you, just keep, you just keep shooting, just yeah. keep shooting. <laughs> around the corner, uh, whatever. But that's right. But when, but when you're on your dollar, that that all counts. And yeah, uh, like when Daryl's talking about price point, like again, you can talk about this. You can talk about these items all day long. Um, but that's the biggest catch is people want. If you're going to run, you know, we got shop, shotgun combos that are on the market. It was a Mossberg's running the three, three barrel combos for a lot of the times are well under 500 bucks. Yep. Well, hell, I remember back in the day, you couldn't buy a Remington 870 replacement barrel for 400 bucks, you know? So what do you right. do? You go get another barrel or do you go just get a whole new shotgun? So with that being said, they're not most likely going to go out and spend a grand on a site for a shotgun. And that's where that crossfire comes in 200 bucks like what the hell do you buy for 200 bucks today and you're going to get that site and then of course you get the vip warranty with it um and it does everything you want it to do and then some so it's a it's a very good pairing it's so cool to hear the guys from vortex 
not pushing the most expensive optic you have out there. It's, it, it's, you know, that, folks, if you're listening to this, this is an honest conversation. And, you know, they're telling you that the Crossfire is the the most versatile, well-rounded optic for, for turkey hunting. So take a look at it on the site. Now, Ridge, I want to I wanna kind of go back, circle back to patterning a little bit. Uh, we talked about patterning and how important it is. And, and we've done exercises. We have videos out there. There's lots of videos out there for patterning. But I don't know if everyone understands uh, shotguns and you mentioned pointing and we point our shotguns at a target. We did an exercise a couple years ago and, uh, we, we pointed our, ta- our shotguns at the target. We had a two inch circle, but the, the results we found were different ammo with different chokes with different guns resulted in a different point of impact, not necessarily the center of that target. So I love the piece that if you put a red dot on, you can correct that, Mm -hmm. correct that all day long with a red dot. But if you don't, if you're using iron sights, you have to remember that gun, that choke, that ammo and where that is. And I have one that I know that shoots low left and I have to correct for that. Yeah. And and here's the thing is, so (laughs) that's very important uh, point because I always go back, um, I'm kind of in the world of precision shooting, but it doesn't make a difference because in my world, it's like whether I shoot pistol, rifle, shotgun, whatever it is, the idea is, is to wherever I aim, that's my point of aim. I want my point of impact to coincide. I want it to be to match. So when I'm speaking to people on the range and they say, oh, that's close enough, that's good enough, I'll just aim a little bit to the left. But, like, that's nonsense. So why do you even bother with sights? Like, they just sew some buttons on the end of it for you. Because, uh, you know, we've got, we've got dials. We have sophisticated sighting devices that are allow you, the shooter, to make those adjustments so that it matches perfectly. So, you know, even if I'm on the range with our precision rifles with the guys and girls, I'm going to tell them, I say, don't settle for good enough, make it right. So even though we're shooting number fours, fives, and sixes at a bird that's 20, 30 yards away at the most, uh, it doesn't matter. You still want to make it right. Don't, don't settle for, I got to aim a little bit off to the head, to the left on the bird. No, put a sight on the shotgun and pattern it and sight it, sight it in. So point of impact it will match your point of aim. And the biggest question I get, especially getting into this time, is how do, how do I do that with a red dot sight and patterning? And, um, and there's just, it's really simple as anything else, finding the mean point of impact. But Daryl, do you want to take this and just run with it? And, uh, and just kind no, of- No, by all means. I mean, feel free. You go right ahead. You're, so, uh, you're- so when, when we talk about patterning shotguns and guys will say, well, I'm going to pattern with my red dot. Is it really necessary to me to even bother doing it with the red dot? And it's always worthwhile to pattern every firearm you have or sight it in. It's, there's no use of why would you even bother putting a sight on a firearm if you weren't going to use it and you didn't want those two points to coincide. So a red dot on a shotgun with, with, a full, uh, with your extra full turkey choke it just makes sense. Like, you know, if we could have done this 200 years ago, if we had the ability, do you think our forefathers wouldn't have wanted to put a red dot on it? Sure. They would have have put it on in a heartbeat. Right. So the idea is to be successful and get the most ethical shot on the game animal and be the precise as we possibly can. Even if we are shooting hundreds of pellets at a bird fairly close, but um, yeah, I, I can't speak enough about, putting sights on firearms and and not settling for good enough. I think that is just, I honestly think that's nonsense. Um, You know, otherwise that we would all be running around with uh, 1600 muskets, you know, (laughs) even at at adults, at at adults. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) That would be cool to put it. No, that would be cool to put a red dot on. (laughs) (laughs) I heard a guy say that at a range one day, he was uh, before deer season and he had taken it, the empty cartridge box set it up at 50 yards and i think he shot five times and hit it twice and then you know he just said okay well that's good enough for deer and was walking away and i was like oh, just like <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's got, you see he's just thinking did i just of, do that in it of deer eh just, yeah. it's oh, just deer. <laughs> yeah. Wait, cool sort of off point to that you know when uh when you first put your when you mounted i just actually did this the other day so i put a a, a venom on a shotgun and 
I haven't been able to, to, to get out to a range and actually shoot it yet. But I took a little pen flashlight and dropped it down the barrel of the shotgun and then pointed at the wall. And then just was able to just look in and just maneuver it around so that the, the center mm -hmm. of the, the flashlight glare on the wall, we put the red dot right in the center. I'm expecting that it, that's going to be shooting pretty spot on when I do get out to the range. So when you do stuff like that, like that's an old school way of doing it. I always refer to, I got a new program coming out in, in the book. I, I always refer to that as the hasty zero or hasty bore sight. Cause you're just doing it right off, off the cuff. Right. Um, so there's lots of ways to do it. When you mount these red dots up too, like with shotguns, you're going to have a, Daryl's already mentioned about putting a rail on top, but a lot of the rifle or shotguns on the market still don't have that capability. They're not drilled and tapped. So we'll use saddle mounts, right? So we'll put a saddle mount on it. Um, definitely not the best way to mount it up, but it is a mount. It's on the right, on the shotgun. Uh, but if you have a cantilever mount, then it's perfect. Cause then you can take the cantilever barrel off attach with the red set, red dot already on whether you put it in some type of a, a gun vise or a cleaning vise or your um, whatever you're using to stabilize the barrel. And you can do exactly what you just said. You just try to, now you've got a, you've got a large gaping hole that you're looking down and you, <laughs> but you do your very best to kind of eye it up in the center. Right. But you're only kind of looking at 25 yards anyways, um, yeah. get it on paper. So kind of eyeball it up and uh, you just continue to turn your turrets until your, your red dot falls in line with target image that you're, that you're looking down your bore. So that's just referred to as an old hasty field, uh, field bore site. You do that on everything from shotguns to rifles to you can, you can do it on anything you need to, to be zeroed. So that's a really good, that's, you know, it's a makeshift way of doing it, but Hey, I'm sure that within that distance, you'll be on paper. And again, just, you know, it's, it's winter. You're kind of stuck inside in Canada and <laughs> well, I, I can, I can tell it. stuff in the basement. <laughs> I just listened to you. I can tell the wheels are turning, right? Yep. <laughs> you're like, <laughs> put the potato gun in head now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Scope taped onto the top of the thing. <laughs> it's funny. I've, got, I've been kind of on this kick about doing a lot more hunting. I, I don't know if I watched you guys or it was on another program about hunting with, uh, with slingshots. So, uh, you know, <laughs> man, I just, uh, you never know. Oh, but, uh, I think we would be remiss if, if we didn't actually point out, and we normally we would do it at the, the, the front end of the show, but Reg being, like, you put out a pretty fantastic book on precision shooting and, and like the, the, the whole technical side of, um, of shooting. And you know, folks, it's, it's worth tracking down and, and reading that book. Pretty incredible. Uh, well, th thanks. I appreciate the, the, the generous uh, comments and stuff. It was my first time putting pen to paper. And uh, so we just put that out there. But we've got a new program that's actually ded dedicated as a firearms optics training program that's going out to law enforcement. And then we have a civilian version that will be released this summer. So, so that will that will be coming out. And uh, But I appreciate that. The, the book is just meant to to have our customers be able to pick it up have it for the cost of it is less than a box of ammunition. So it will pay for itself the first time they open it up, but it's to give them the knowledge so that from that point on, as soon as they open up the book and any page, they're going to learn how to use what they're learning at on the range. Right. And uh, that's where, that's where it came from. So thank you. Thank you again. I appreciate Good. that. No, it's a, uh some of the math made my head hurt a little bit, but <laughs> <laughs> understanding what's happening when you're shooting long distances, though, just, uh, I know we're getting away from the, uh, from the red dot and close range Turkey stuff, but it, uh, I didn't want to circle back to that because, well, but you know, it all pertains to the same thing because everything you're learning, uh, on the long gun, uh, any, t on any type of site and adjustment, you can carry that over to your Turkey hunting as well, sighting in your red dot, all that kind of stuff everything comes together. It's the same principle. So um, it, it all, it all lends nicely together. It's just to, to educate the, the shooter and make them better at their craft. But the nice thing is once they learn their capabilities, it really promotes our product as well because they're able to make use of the product as it was made to be used for. So we get a lot of customers that'll buy optics that really, it's almost like Hollywood sells it, right? They think they need more than what they really need and they don't understand. So the, these, these red dots are fantastic because even though they're very simple, 
do as what's needed. They provide you with an aiming source. Um, and uh, once again, keeping it simple is where it's at. All the other stuff is great, but we got to think about the end deal. And that's, we need to have something simple that works and that's going to work with your, your application. Well, we've always kind of advocated the, you know, take what your budget is like, take what your budget is. If you're going to go and buy a new combo, what you're going to be spending on your gun, you should be spending on your optic, you know, mm -hmm. and it's just uh, kind of a rule of thumb. If you've got a thousand bucks to spend on your, on your setup, you know, look for a gun that's in that, you know, five to 600 range and look for a, um, an optic that's going to be in that five to $600 range or two to three or, you know, 800 to a thousand. It's, uh, it's, it's going to be different for everybody. That's why I really like your point about the, uh, the, the crossfire, you know, like you said, 200 bucks and like, that literally, well, you will have that scope forever because even if you, you know, lose it in a house fire, you're going to get a brand new one from the VIP warranty. As long as you've got it, you got to be able to, to show the body. <laughs> uh, yeah. And like, and like Daryl will vouch for this. Like we have guys and girls that'll buy multiple uh, optics the same. So they'll buy two or three of them because they don't want to take it off one fire and put it on another yeah. one. I'm just going to zero my fire and put it away and it's good to go for 200 bucks and it's done. Uh, um, I'll let Daryl go into more onto that and replacement and stuff like that. But it's, uh, yeah, it's again, $200. You can't, you know, you take your kids out to McDonald's today, you're taking the wife <laughs> or something. You, you just spent $60 going through drive through So, you know, um, back when we could go to movies, <laughs> those were good times. <laughs> we'll get there again. Back to the battery use that we had mentioned with, uh, Reg had mentioned leaving the battery uh, uh, inside of the unit and taking it out of the unit for long periods of storage. If you do ever have that battery leak or any issues with any of your red dots or anything Vortex, uh, you can certainly give us a call, uh, visit our website and our VIP warranty will absolutely make sure that that's uh, looked after. A lot of the times uh, the calls that I get with regards to some of the red dots not illuminating or not powering on uh, can and is attributed to the battery itself and or the battery quality being used. Uh, the importance of our red dot illuminating when we need it in the field is a no-brainer. Uh, without the red dot, we could very easily, we're essentially looking at a blank window without a point of aim. Choosing a battery of lesser, less than high quality um, compromises that uh, in the field and I always recommend just choosing a battery uh, that is brand new and of high quality at the starting of every season. That's fantastic. That, that's a, a kind of a, a funny piece that I think confuses some people like if if I am in the field and my my dot doesn't come on because you know the battery or a malfunction can I just look through that and assume that the center of my sight is going to be where the red dot is and I'm going to hit what I'm aiming at? No, I know the answer, but I'd like to hear yours. Yeah, no, no, I, I certainly wouldn't be trusting that. That's a sin. You can pretty much close your eyes and take the shot, and you would have about as much accuracy at that point in time. Uh, I, I joke a little bit, but <clears throat> no. Um, unfortunately, that is that is the one thing with the red dots. Uh, we do have available. Uh, um, uh, prism optics, uh, and again, not to go into the weeds, our, our Spitfires, our uh, prism optics, and the difference among other things in prism optics compared to the red dot optics is that you do have a glass etched reticle. So in those situations, if you do have a prismatic optic and your battery power does die on you and you don't have a backup battery with you, you still maintain a point of aim. So that is a feature that, say, for example, our, our Spitfire would certainly uh, leverage over uh, over the red dots when you're considering it for a hunting or a field application. Now, um, we are just about out of time here, but before, it's funny, you know, the more we talk about different things, the more I think about, oh, we need to discuss more about that. It's just like, my head's expanding here as we uh, go through this. <laughs> so I just want to mention, folks, that uh, we will take the Turkey Talk podcast offline and, and go to the Real Outdoor Experience channel at some point with uh, these guys from Vortex with Daryl and Reg and, and maybe Neil and, uh, you know, the top experts on, on optics here in, in Canada and just discuss the finer points of all these things. So watch for that. It's coming down the line at some point. But... We've talked about the VIP warranty a little bit, and anybody that knows Vortex knows about the VIP warranty. But if you're new to Vortex, 
there's something in the fire service that, that we, we call it, it's, we use no duff. So if we're doing training and we say, uh, we're injured, no duff, that means that we're not joking because we, we joke a lot and we play around a lot with each other, but for this instance, we're not joking. So the VIP warranty is no duff. It is as good as it sounds. So, Daryl, can you go into the VIP warranty a little bit? Absolutely. I, I'd love to. The VIP warranty, it's it's an unlimited, unconditional, lifetime VIP warranty. Um, and I like I like your description of the no duff because it really is. It's it's no duff. I just heard it, but the VIP warranty equals no duff. Um, <sighs> Really, uh, we really want to make it as easy as possible. We understand um, anybody, if any, if you do ever have an issue or you just want to talk about hunting, you want to talk about optics, some recommendations, you you're, reach out to us and you will reach an end optics user. Um, we are all passionate outdoor enthusiasts. We may not all hunt, but we all are end users of our optics. And we do know how important of tools these are. Essentially, if you're down your binos before your hunt, you, you might as well cut off your left hand. Uh, if you're out of range finder, cut off your left foot. Um, it, they are very, very important tools. And um, this is where uh, we're very, very lucky to be able to offer the VIP warranty uh, in, in the capacity that we do. It's a no questions asked, hassle-free warranty. This is uh, unlimited, unconditional, fully transferable, and you'll never, you'll never be required to provide a proof of purchase. Um, really, if something happens to it, reach out to us and we're going to get you looked after in the quickest and mo keeping it simple. Back to the beginning of the uh, podcast, uh, full circle, keeping it simple is really what the VIP warranty is about and looking after the customer and the customer's needs. So please, if you guys have any questions at all uh, or any needs with regards to that, give us a shout, reach out to us via email, um, give me a call. Um, I can be reached anytime at extension 808 at the main office line. We're here and always happy to help. That transferable piece, anybody that, that knows me has heard me say it. You see a Vortex Optics, binocular, spotting scope, rifle scope, anything at a garage sale, buy it. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> I know where this is going. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah, it's, they make great gifts. They put them on absolutely everything. But, I mean, it, it, is, it's, it is no duff. You know, how many did you guys send out to Fort McMurray with the wildfires? You know, people lost all kinds of stuff you know, when that, uh, when that tragedy occurred, but I know that, uh, on the insurance side of things, we get, you know, what do I do about this? Like, oh, was that Vortex? Give them a call. <laughs> you, know? Yeah. you know, we almost need to change our low, our, our saying instead of losing the VIP it just say, uh, don't lose it <laughs> because <that's basically laughs> it. Uh, if you don't lose it, we've, we've got it covered. Right. And, uh, yeah, like fires, um, we all, things happen, life happens. So, yeah. you know, I, I don't know what it is. Was it 50%, Daryl? I have no idea what the percentage is, but as long as you can tell it's Vortex and it's our product, um, yeah. if something's happened to it, we'll, we'll stand by it. Um, the beautiful <laughs> thing about Vortex is um, it's a family-owned company. If you guys, I think you guys already knew that and maybe put, put that out already uh, to your uh, listeners, but we're a family-owned company in the States out of Wisconsin. And because it's not a big conglomerate owned by different, all sorts of, you know, too many roosters in the head house, the Hamilton family are, uh, let me not use any of this quotations, no duff family. So, <laughs> so they're not going to nickel and dime you as a customer. If you lose a, a lens cap, like Daryl will tell you firsthand that we have customers that call us and, and they're valued customers that have been with us for a number of years. And they're worried about, Oh, I lost my flip up and flip up cap on a, on a red dot or whatever. And Daryl is the first that person that they would reach out to. And Daryl doesn't bat an eye. It's like, how can I help you? I'm just going to send you one out. Where do you need it right now? It's like, and uh, so that's the way he operates in the warranty department. And that's the way Vortex, that's their, their mentality is to not nickel and dime. We're just here to make it right. Um, in the grand scheme of things, is it going to kill us to flip a uh, uh, flip cap or replace something that needs to be replaced? Not at all, but we're going to make you happy. Yeah. And you're not, we know you're not going anywhere. So you're coming back to us. So <laughs> it all <clears throat> want to keep you close. Exactly. You know, we've been, uh, we've been with Vortex for, uh, I don't even know how many years now. And it's just been such a great relationship. 
uh, obviously we love the products. That's, that's how we got, you know, started with Vortex and, uh, you know, the warranty, obviously, thank goodness we haven't had to use it at any point so far. Uh, is, but relationships like this, the expertise, the knowledge and the customer service is it's like on a crazy level. You just, you know, I, I think back to the years ago, I'm not old enough to go, well, maybe I can remember going to the gas station where you'd pull up and they would wipe your windows and, you know, there's full serve and you didn't pay any extra for it. That was just the customer service you get. That's not out there a whole lot anymore. Vortex is different. So yeah. So proud to be with you guys. And, and, you know, thanks so much for coming on today. And like I said earlier, the more we talk about these things, the more I, I keep thinking, oh yeah, we got to talk about that. We got to talk about that. We got to talk about that. So this won't be the last uh, video or podcast we put out with you guys. We're going to have to do another one for sure. At some we, point. We are. I, get, I haven't asked if we haven't talked about range finders yet. No. We <laughs> Hey, and you then, know something, just to, to try to plug, since you're going down that road, um, we do have to come back and talk to you because we have a new range finder out in that bino, that AB, that um, there's going to be uh, some customers out there that are just, you know, itching at the bit to hear some some info on that. So um, we got some new really cool products coming out. Yeah. Uh, you know what? And that's, uh, again, just one last, or, you know, turkey hunting is going to be close range inside 50 yards for the most part you know you hear a lot of guys talking about well i've shot turkeys at 70 yards i question whether or not people know what 70 yards looks like <laughs> when they're sitting on the ground with their back up against the tree but having a rangefinder has saved my butt a whole bunch of times and you know what folks add that into your uh, just your sort of calculations and your budget you need to have one of those in your pocket particularly with um those shorter range instances because the difference between 20 yards and 40 yards with a shotgun is a lot different than the difference between 150 and 175 yards with a rifle. So um, I think you're, I think you're spot on there too. Cause um, when we think about distances, it, you know, very few people out there know what an actual, what 40 yards look like than an archery hunter or archery shooter. Like that's constantly knows that every yard counts. Uh, Daryl shoots bow so he can weigh in too. He knows the importance of that, but um but having that ability to be able to say, I know exactly what 40 yards is, whether to put my birds out for decoys or just lays where you want to put them. And you know exactly that's 40 yards. Um, Daryl and I were talking this before we came on the podcast is we got talking about distances, right? And and I'm with you. I I don't think like 60 yards is beyond shooting a turkey. Like, you know, it's, it's 40 and in, and in most cases it's 20 and in. Um, so close. But I do want to say one last little tidbit because I, I didn't get a chance to, uh, to kind of elaborate on it. And it was just when we were talking about magnified optics, because now that we're into turkey hunting, um, we can take turkeys not only with shotguns, but we can take with archery equipment. And we've got a new scope that's out that came out for us uh, and it's a crossbow scope. Mm. And I've got a daughter that I'm taking out this year. And I'm hoping that she's going to be able to harvest a turkey on our property. And I want her to do it with the crossbow and with this new crossfire uh, uh, compound, uh, crossfire uh, crossbow scope. Thank you. Uh, I'm getting a little off topic here. <laughs> so uh, if you, if you're interested, have your viewers just go to our website and check it out because I got to tell you um, we've done it completely right on this unit. It's a, it's affordable, but B, the flexibility of it is phenomenal. The glass is great uh, and it's very, very easy to use. And you can tune it to any crossbow uh, on the market. It's So you can tune it to speed uh, and you can marry it up with that. So um, please think about that. Also come turkey hunting if you are an archer hunting and you are getting involved with that and you wanna use a crossbow, please think of us, at least come to a, and check it out, go to our website. Um, you will not be disappointed. I just can't, I, I just rave about it. It's phenomenal. This is a great point to mention because there are areas where you can't uh, use a gun to hunt on Sundays and using, uh, using archery equipment, you know, and well, crossbow is included in that um, is a, it's just a great reminder. Carl and you actually put up a uh, video a little while ago um, of how to mount and then use the, uh, the crossfire cross. Yeah. Uh, yep. Oh, so that's a, 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 timely, uh, a timely reminder, Reg, because that's, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's <clears throat> on the, uh, great the thinking board, like, right? YouTube channel. You can uh, Google it and you'll see Carl himself out there doing it. So, 
Thanks, Excellent. Claude. Thanks. I honestly think we could uh, probably fill out a good couple hour episodes of uh, our new products that are being launched this year from our tripods um, to the crossbow scope uh, to the, uh, the low power variable optics. Uh, there's just there's so many that are coming out. There's a lot of exciting things coming down the pipeline that have already come out this year. And um, I'm just constantly, constantly excited. As Reg mentioned, the Fury, uh, the Fury AB binoculars, um, they've partnered up with Applied Ballistics. Uh, those, we could honestly have an hour long uh, podcast just on the features and functions of those. Uh, so your binocular combo. E, that is correct, sir. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, without getting too much into the weeds on the on that one, there it is a it's a powerhouse of a unit. It's our Fury Five Thousand range finding binoculars that have partnered up with the AB um, the ballistics company uh, to uh, acquire and utilize uh, the data that the uh, the AB company uh, already has in there. So. Um, those are very, very exciting and probably what has me most excited this year. I would say the Fury AB binoculars as well as our tripod launches. Um, the red dot redesigns, phenomenal as well. Awesome. Awesome. Folks, if, uh, if you're looking to see all these products, vortexcanada.net, the 2021 catalog is on the website. You can go there and download it and check it all out. There's so much in there and the pictures are awesome. Uh, you can spend hours reading this stuff. There's just so much and we really wish we could continue on here, but maybe mm -hmm. your battery life is dying and uh, or your uh, hour commute to work is over. So we'll have to do <laughs> this again at some point. Daryl and Reg, thank you guys. Thanks so much for being on here. It's uh, it, I just can't say enough about Vortex. We were absolutely uh, thrilled to be part of the Vortex Nation and so happy to represent the, the great people and, and the great products that you guys uh, put out every year. And uh, obviously, uh, so much depth of knowledge comes from you guys. So if anybody, I know we've said it before, if anybody has any questions, just reach out vortexcanada.net. Phone numbers are on the website contact information's on the website and you, and you can get to these guys through there. So Ian, any last words? No, you know what? Just uh, again, thanks. Keep doing what you're doing. And that's uh, um, really excited to see the new products and the, uh, the tripods that are uh, going to be what I'm sort of researching next and uh, just excited to get out into the field and hope the glad winter's over, but really <laughs> appreciate you giving us some time today. And uh, Daryl, your, uh, your knowledge is really vast in those red dots. And it's, it's nice to hear some of the science behind them. It's really cool. We could talk for hours, but we need to wrap it up. But <laughs> it's not a, uh, not a once and done. But yeah, you know what? Thanks, guys. Really appreciate the time. Well, thank you. Thank you for what you guys do. And uh, yeah, we appreciate you having us on. Thanks. Reg, any last words? No, it's pretty much, you don't want to get me talking. You can't shut me up. <laughs> uh, no, it's great. Like Daryl said, it's, it's great that you guys are there and doing what you're doing. And uh, it's all about conservation and get out there. If, you know, we're seeing such a large number of people wanting to get involved with, with the hunting and shooting sports, even though with the political climate we're in today here in Canada. So um, please uh, get out there and, and, uh, and participate, you know, uh, find yourself a, uh, a firearms instructor or if you're into archery find yourself a hunter education instructor and uh and please jump on board uh, daryl is just uh was just saying that he's doing his hunter ed portion here and it's available online so um there's no reason if you have an interest go do it yeah welcome well, to the addiction daryl yeah. yeah. thank you, <laughs> thank um, you. I gotta, and by the way guys he is addicted especially on the firearm side he's <laughs> so it, it's not it's nice to see it's great to see <laughs> It's funny, I, we, we, and I know we're cutting this off here shortly, but we talk about buying one gun that does many things. Yeah, I tried that too. Yeah, I was going to call you. I didn't think it was appropriate to say liar, liar on the air. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because uh, just before we go, um, I mentioned about Vortex being a family-owned company, and it is in the States, but our, uh, our distributor here in, in Canada is Paul and, and Val, so Paul Grant and Val Wyatt. And uh, so those are our, our owners for Vortex Canada. And Paul just started himself hunting within the last couple of years. And and he he too has fallen into that trap, right? You start off with one <laughs> firearm and then fire. So it's really nice to see. I'm just all giggles and laughing at these guys because mm -hmm. we all know what it's like yeah. to get your first firearm where you get out there and going. And 
Uh, Daryl is just phenomenal. He does such a great job for us at Vortex. And for those that are listening here, and you, when you call, it's chances are you are going to be uh, speaking with Daryl firsthand. So we do our very best, and and uh, we do have the very best of employees, and Daryl is definitely one of them. Awesome. I think. Right. Awesome. Daryl Wilson and Reg Wales from Vortex Canada. We really appreciate the uh, the time. Really appreciate the time. So, um, Carlin. Thanks, everybody, for uh, listening and tuning in to the CWTF's Turkey Talk podcast. We're your hosts, Carlin and Ian from the Real Outdoor Experience. Thanks again, Daryl Wilson, Ridge Wales from Vortex Canada. And don't forget, everybody, tune in always. See you, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Take care for now, folks. Thanks. Take care. Thanks for staying with us. You have been listening to the Canadian Wild Turkey Federation's Turkey Talk podcast with your hosts, Carl and Ian from the Real Outdoor Experience. Tune in next time as we have an amazing lineup of both guests and subjects that span across the outdoors. Don't forget, get your kids outdoors and always keep it real. <laughs>